War, war never changes. A recurring theme in every Fallout game. Just like the Brotherhood of Steel, who have a prominent role in the latest Fallout game, Fallout 4. This time their goal is to protect the inhabitants of the Commonwealth against a dangerous and shadowy institute. But is this really the case? The Brotherhood is very capable of doing very, very dodgy things to achieve their objectives. So are they really the good guys? Or are they more comparable to one of history's most mischievous regimes? And did war really not change? That is something we're going to explore in this week's video. Start the show. Hey you, I'm Hank and welcome back to GC for another episode of our series on the behind the scenes of the gaming industry. I did say this week's video was going to be a little more lighthearted, and here we are. This time we're looking into the Brotherhood of Steel and especially its representation in Fallout 4. The technocratic organization that is trying to use technology of pre-war America to improve the quality of life in the wasteland and to carve out a new society. No, no that's not really true, and also there's like spoilers and stuff. See, the Brotherhood of Steel's origins are first explored in the very first Fallout game. The Technocratic Society was formed on the west coast of the United States with the very noble aim of securing pre-war technology to prevent humanity from making the same mistakes and to help rebuild society. This creed, however, seems to have been forgotten after the many years since the Brotherhood of Steel was founded. In the meantime, the Brotherhood has wasted no time to collect the Wasteland's remaining technology for themselves. Not a very noble aim, in my opinion. In 2287, a part of the Brotherhood would depart after defeating the genocidal enclave, the remnants of the former United States government for the East Coast, to see what is left of the former capital, Washington, DC. The East Coast of the United States is more dangerous and less settled than the comparatively safe West Coast, where entire new communities and countries have successfully popped into existence. The new California Republic, for example, based out of Shady Sands, has managed to create at least a semblance of peace and security. It fields its own army and has a democratically elected president to look after it. The East Coast, however, is full of all sorts of dangerous threats, from super mutants and other mutated inhabitants, shadowy pre-war organizations, and even the powerful remnants of the Enclave, who employ rather extreme measures to try and restore the wasteland to its former glory. During the events of Fallout 3, the Brotherhood of Steel is starting to experience a shift. They allow inhabitants of the wasteland to join their ranks, something that previous variants of the organization would have never allowed, with only children of current members and certain high skill individuals being allowed to join the up until then exclusive club. The Brotherhood on the East Coast starts to transition from a quasi-religious technocratic organization to a sort of loving government, in charge of basic necessities and keeping the small communities of the Capital Wasteland alive. In a way, it starts to look like its own country, from a certain point of view. But I can hear you thinking, Hank, the Brotherhood of Steel doesn't look like the bad guy at all, let alone being on par with, say, the Nazis. And you'd be right, up until this point, anyway. The Brotherhood of Steel we see in Fallout 4, however, is not exactly the same to that of Fallout 3. For starters, the leadership has changed. After the death of Elder Lyons, who was in charge of it during the events of Fallout 3, it's now being led by Arthur Maxson, a direct descendant of the original founder of the Brotherhood of Steel named Roger Maxson. And the way they behave themselves during the storyline of Fallout 4 has managed to put some doubt in my mind about the Brotherhood's true intentions. So let's roll all the lore bits back a bit and peek behind the curtain of what we shall call game design for a minute. The first iteration of the Brotherhood of Steel was developed by Interplay Productions back in 1997. They heavily featured the Brotherhood of Steel, but they were never really supposed to be the moral good guys. They shifted quite a bit with Bethesda acquiring the studio. The change to them becoming more of the good guys in the story, in my opinion, isn't inherently bad. However, the change between the Interplay, the Bethesda versions, and the Obsidian developed variant of Fallout, New Vegas, have very different versions of the group in it. Obsidian and Interplay featured a darker Brotherhood that was an inherently flawed organization, with the potential of doing the right thing if the player pushed them down the right path. Bethesda's Brotherhood of Steel is meant as a more morally good organization. However, when we give them a more in-depth look, we start to spot 
some of the first cracks. The wasteland has always been a rough place for its minorities. Ghouls, humans turned by radiation into these walking and talking corpses, for example, are treated like second-rate citizens. And the dangerous super mutants are to be avoided, or if you're a part of the Brotherhood, you might even actively hunt them down. Not every super mutant is an insane, unreasonable murderer, however. On the West Coast, super mutants like Marcus are highly intelligent, and even followed force companion Strong can be reasoned with to an extent. Something that doesn't matter at all to the Brotherhood, who would rather wipe these abominations out. However, a better example of active abuse by the Brotherhood would be the newly reintroduced Synths. Created by the shadowy institute in the Boston Commonwealth, Synths are indistinguishable from real human beings, depending on which generation of Synth we're talking about, of course. Even though they were created to serve the institute's needs, they often have their own thoughts on things and will attempt to escape the Institute via an organization called the Railroad, which is partly based on the historical railroad that tried to help escape slaves from the southern United States during its Civil War period. The Brotherhood of Steel views since as abominations that have to be wiped off the face of the Earth. And did you just see that? Suddenly, the Brotherhood of Steel has something in common with history's most vile regime to ever exist. So without losing all the ad revenue here, can this really be true? We have to go a little deeper to avoid the impending Godwin. So, are the Brotherhood of Steel really like the Nazis? I'd had to look myself in for a few weeks to connect all the loose ends, but I think I've finally figured it out. The Brotherhood of Steel has a way out that isn't just, well, Bethesda designed them as something else. One of the endings of Fallout 4 allows you to unite the Brotherhood of Steel with not only the Minutemen, but also the previously named Railroad. The synth resistance will aid in the destruction of the Institute, and Uncle Arthur will not force you to destroy it after getting rid of the Institute beforehand. To reach this ending, however, it is imperative that you complete all the side quests for both of these factions. And when you don't, there's only one option. The complete destruction of the other parties by any means. And before the release of the Far Harbor DLC, this meant the complete and total destruction of all sins in the Commonwealth. So once again, the player actually has a choice, like in previous fallouts, to steer the Brotherhood of Steel away from its self-righteous opinions to make it see a different light. The player is also the only one in the final attack on the Institute who can start a final evacuation of the people living there, by asking the director of the Institute to set it in motion. The result, however, is always the same. The complete destruction of the Institute into a mighty nuclear fireball, which left me a little wanting at the end. We also never see the inhabitants of the Institute again, and them losing their homes in this way could have been seen as an act of genocide by the United Nations had they still existed in 2287. And now to be fair to the Brotherhood, the Institute isn't really a fun bunch themselves. In fact, the same could be said about all the factions and organizations in the Commonwealth. So perhaps by comparing the Brotherhood to the worst regime in history, that might just be a bit much. The Brotherhood of Steel certainly has some fascist elements. It also has some humanist ideals. Have they been corrupted completely? That kind of depends on the player and his actions. Brotherhood of Steel finds itself in an extraordinary situation. The Wasteland is a dangerous place to live. And it looks like the Brotherhood is at least trying to improve the standard of living of the average human being somewhat. Uh, unless your name is Proctor Quinlan, of course, and you have to extort food from all these pesky farmers around the wasteland to support the troops, after all. But that mission is very optional, and it can be said that this isn't official policy of the Brotherhood of Steel. So in conclusion, it can be said that the Brotherhood, next to the Minutemen, are followed for good guys. The Brotherhood doesn't really succeed in it, however, and sometimes the lives of minorities are made even more difficult by their presence. However, the Brotherhood of Steel is probably the best chance for the East Coast of America to form at least some sort of functioning society, and to maybe one day become an actual country once more. Because war... War never changes. And that's why I sincerely hope that in the next Fallout game there won't be the main feature. Yes, the Brotherhood of Steel looks cool. You can let loose some morality on them and judge them by their actions and the consequences of those actions. However, the big guys with the laser miniguns and the power armors are sometimes a little bland. The way they were presented by Obsidian in their Fallout New Vegas was, in my opinion, much more interesting. As a sort of questline on the side, 
you could play the game without ever really meeting them. In my opinion, that is the way it should be. This little technocratic society stuck in their bunker afraid of the outside world was to me their most interesting iteration. But you probably have differing opinions. Or maybe you'd agree. Regardless, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. So that was it for our second video of the new format. As I've said, a little lighter and not too serious. I was expecting to make a video about Star Citizen's 3.0 rendition in the coming weeks, but still hasn't been released, and I don't really want to write a video based on speculations uh, of a bunch of alpha testers, so that will probably come at a later date. In the meantime, I'm working on some more background behind the scenes style content, and the next video will probably take a look at one of gaming's most famous settings. It's probably not what you're thinking, but let us know anyway in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe if you like what you see, and like last week, I'll see you again in a week or two.